Christ. Amen and amen. Last week, we talked about seeing Jesus. We went uh, from John chapter 8 where Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Now I want to talk about the way that Jesus Christ saw the Father, the way that Jesus Christ saw his destiny, and the way that he was able to make it. Jesus Christ is not only our Lord, but he's also our example. And Jesus Christ came to give us life, the Bible says in John 10, and he came, us, he came to give us life more abundantly. Jesus Christ has not come to make your life more difficult, except in one sense, as the man of God was talking about. But ultimately, he wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have rest. He wants you to have consolation. He wants you to have peace. And this peace is his presence. He says that he's not giving you the kind of peace that the world gives. He's giving you a peace that surpasses understanding. See, in the world, the peace that people have is really just a pause between pains. When I was in the world and I was getting drunk with my friends and partying, you know, I enjoyed getting drunk. I enjoyed all that stuff. But I knew even when I was drinking that beer, I was drinking that wine, I knew that this thing was going to lift eventually. I knew that in the morning I was going to have a hangover. And the fact that I anticipated the evil that was going to happen because of what I was doing, it made the joy not as strong. But the joy that you have in Jesus is the joy of his presence. And he said that he will not leave you nor forsake you. God wants us to have faith. He wants you to walk by faith, not by sight. Now, my old pastor told me something that was really important. He said that you don't walk by your feelings. You walk by faith. But listen to me. If you're really walking by faith, if you really have faith, if you really have a holy expectation, it should result in a certain feeling. Your hope, the faith that you have in Jesus should result in a certain feeling. The best day, the happiest day that we have in my job and my work is payday, okay? Now, why is payday so fun? Why is payday so happy? It's not because people are going to, you know, go to the bank and, and actually withdraw money and, and look at the coins and, and look at the dollars and play with it like children. No, the money is the substance of something that they hope for. Amen. The money is the substance of a vacation. The money is, is the substance of, of the groceries. The money is the substance of the PS3 or the PS4, or the PS5, whatever they want to have. The faith that you have is supposed to be a substance of something that you hope for. When you have real faith, you're happy. <laughs> when you have real faith, you know, the, the hope that we have is not just, you know, you know whatever will be, will be, you know, it's just... It's going to be all right, like a resignation. No, it's supposed to be a real faith that results in a real feeling. I remember John Osteen, not Joe Osteen, but John Osteen, the father of Joe Osteen. Yeah, he had this book, and also I think he had a sermon called Saturday's Coming. Somebody say Saturday's Coming. <laughs> and it was about this boy that uh, had friends that he would play with. And they all had bikes, and they would ride around with their bikes in the city and in the neighborhood. And, and he was the only boy. This one boy was the only boy that didn't have a bike. He was the only one among them that didn't have a bike. And one Thursday, I think it was, his father made a promise to him. He said that when payday comes, you're going to have a bike. You are going to have a bike just like the rest of the people that you're playing with. And even though the boy didn't have a bike, at the point that the promise was made, he still didn't have a bike, but he had joy. He, he, he had gladness. Why? Because even though he was a boy that didn't have a bike, he no longer saw himself as the boy that didn't have a bike because of the promise that came from a faithful father. Are you here? And so God has made promises to you. Hallelujah. He has made promises to you, and the promise that he makes invites you into seasons of hardship. The promise that he makes actually invites a wilderness into your world. Some of us are distraught. Some of us are downtrodden. Some of us are depressed. Some of us are despondent, not because we don't know God, but because we have seen so much of the glory of God, Pastor Adewale. We have seen so much of the glory of God in the past 
that we have an expectation that that glory that we've seen should live on. And the world that we're looking at right now is not in harmony with what we have seen. Are you here? The promise that God gives you actually creates a wilderness. It creates a tension between the reality that you see at the present time and the reality that you expect. And my job as a preacher is to help you through that season. It's not necessarily my job to give you the promise. You go to God and he'll give you the promise. You look at the word and that word should create a sense of promise in your heart. But my job is to keep you happy and keep you content until that thing materializes, until that thing comes to pass. No. In the Bible, when Mary got a visitation from the angel, <laughs> Mary's like, man, how am I going to have a baby? How is this thing going to happen? How can this be seen as though I've never known a man? And the angel said, with God, nothing is impossible. And if you look at it in the original Greek, that word nothing is the word rhema. Somebody say rhema. Rhema has to do with the spoken word of God. Logos is the written word. That's, that's what we have in front of us, the Holy Writ, the Bible. But the rhema is the word that actually proceeds from heaven when he actually speaks to you. And literally, it means in the Greek, man, that every word of God has the power within itself to make it come to pass. Are you here? Every word that God speaks to you is pregnant with power. It has the power within itself to make itself come to pass. The word is as seed. Are you here? And seeds are pre-programmed to bring forth a certain result, a certain harvest. Are you here? But if you don't have a heart of, of, of thanksgiving, a heart of gratitude, a heart of hope, expectation, and joy, then between the time that the promise is given and the time that the promise comes to pass, you can find yourself despondent. You can find yourself depressed. I remember I was talking to uh, this man of God named Apostle Stearns that I used, to, I used to speak to. He was kind of a mentor to me. And he was talking about his time in ministry. And, and he was talking about how at the beginning it was just so rough. And we were just kind of relating to each other and bonding to each other, with each other. And he said, man of God, I'm not quite as eloquent as you. I'm not, I'm not like eloquent like you are. And I'm like, what are you talking about eloquent? Because when I think of eloquence, I'm, talk, I'm thinking like, you know, being well-spoken or being articulate. That has nothing to do with what we were talking about. And what he was saying is, I'm not as polished as you are. I know I'm kind of more hood. I'm kind of more street. I'm kind of more gangster. And he was telling me that when things weren't working the way he expected things to work, he actually cursed God. Okay, he actually spoke disrespectfully to God because things weren't happening the way, the way he envisioned. And see... In all things, you need to be content. Somebody say content. Mm. I know there was this one bishop, and uh, he just had a, a, he always had this, this sense of repose. He was always calm. And they asked him, hey, man, wh what's the key to you always being content? Why are you always happy? And he said, it's because of where I keep my eyes. He said, when I look up, I see heaven. And I realize that the main business of my life is in heaven. He said that when I look down, I think of the little corner of space that's going to be needed to bury me. And he said, when I look around me, I see all the people who have worse conditions, who are in worse circumstances than what I'm in right now. Are you here? And so the truth is that God will rarely give you that which, which, that which you cannot be happy without. I repeat, God will rarely give you that which you cannot be happy without. Being content, being happy in him will actually accelerate the blessing. He's not going to have no other gods entertained. He don't want nobody else before him worshiped as God. That thing that you want, that thing that you're after, if it's robbing you of the joy, the fact that you don't have it, if that's making you to be depressed, if that's making you so that you have no joy, no happiness whatsoever, man, you're actually making it harder for God to bless you. Okay, you're actually making it tougher for God to give you what you really want because in all things you have to be content in him. He's not a God that's going to foster your idolatry. Are you here? And so I want to talk to you really quickly uh, from the Bible, talking about Elijah. Somebody say Elijah. The Bible tells us 
that Elijah was a man of like passions as us. We, he had the same disposition. He had the same feelings. He had the same weaknesses that we have. But he was a man of uncommon faith. He was a man of uncommon devotion. And so God used him in an uncommon way. The children of Israel were, were yoked by idolatry. They were bound to, to Baal and all this idol worship. And there was one man, Elijah, who was willing to stand up and fight for God and represent God's interests in a hostile environment. And basically, he laid a challenge to, to the, the prophets of Baal and to the God, Baal, and there was a showdown. Now, you could look at a showdown, you could look at this expectation, you could look at this, uh, this scenario that he created and say, well, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's challenging God or he's putting God to the test. No, he's not putting God to the test. There's a difference between putting God to the test and giving God an opportunity to show himself. Are you here? He was actually giving God an opportunity to show himself so that the children of Israel could be brought back to him and basically he said if God be God if the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob is the true God he's going to manifest himself are you here and that has really been like the, the watch words of my life I, I put God at the front burner of my life and said look God I'm submitting myself to you my life, my soul, my breath, my journey, everything belongs to you. And I made up in my mind a long time ago that if I cannot make it God's way, if I cannot make it following God's decrees, if I cannot make it following God's principles, then life isn't really worth anything anyway. Allow God to be God. You deserve to know whether or not this stuff really works. Are you here? As a Christian, you have the right to know whether or not your God is really faithful. So, so we have this dilemma. <laughs> we have this situation that, that Elijah creates, and, and God shows himself, and the 450 prophets of Baal are killed. And after this, Jezebel is, is angry. After this, Jezebel is really hot. And she basically makes a promise that Elijah is going to be killed. Now watch this, saints. If, if Jezebel really just wanted Elijah dead, why would she bring the news to him that his life was in jeopardy? If she really just wanted Elijah killed, she should have just brought some henchmen to do her will and kill him. But what did she do? She brought the word to Elijah so that Elijah would become frightened and that he would be disgraced as well as his God. Are you here? And that's all the enemy really has the right to do. All he has the right to do is speak to you. All he really has the right to do is to get you to sabotage the mission that God has given you because of your own unbelief, because of the way that you're thinking. See, if Satan was really as bad as many of us think he is, that he could just shut down church, whatever business that you're working at, he could just make sure that the business completely doesn't work or, or he can make sure that everybody that's that's working with you dies he's not but what he does is he makes you feel like it's not going to work he makes you feel like God's promise in your world is not going to materialize and you end up quitting because of what you believe and so if if Satan is speaking to you you should actually be encouraged <laughs> Even though he's speaking that which contradicts the promise of God, you should be encouraged. Why? Because that's all he has the authority to do, is to speak into your mind and get you to punk out on what God has for you. See, in war, in the United States military, we have this thing called the PSYOP. Somebody say PSYOP. <laughs> it stands for psychological operations. And when we had this war against Iraq, they had the PSYOP unit uh, staging things like, if, I don't know if you remember when they had the statue of, of, of Saddam Hussein and it, it toppled and we saw all the Iraqis dancing around it. Now that was a real thing, but the PSYOP section of the U.S. Army actually helped to intensify that scene. They actually helped to, to bring down the statue and make it seem like a bigger event than what it really was. Why? Because they wanted the people of Iraq to see that and get a sense of what the prospects of the nation were and get a sense of the way Saddam Hussein was really received. Are you here? 
PSYOP, psychological operations. Satan specializes in psychological operations in order to defeat you in war. And the truth is that you can't overcome him by yourself. You can't overcome the devil with positive self-talk. That's what the world does. They stand in front of a mirror and they give you these affirmations to say, I am beautiful, I am handsome, I am rich. No, you can't overcome him by yourself. You need the word of God, you need the truth of God, and you need the spirit of God in order to overcome the enemy. Are you here? And so Elijah, who was so bold, so strong in faith, now... He's on the run. The man that was esteemed and known because of his courage is now running. Now he's embarrassed. Now he has humiliated himself and his testimony. And he's gotten to the point now that he wants to die. He's actually asking God to kill him. What do you do, saints, when the thing that you thought was going to bring you joy, you get it and the joy doesn't come? What do you do when the thing that you thought was going to give you that feeling of security and that feeling of, of, of affirmation and that self-actualization? What do you do when that thing that you're hoping for, you get it? He wanted this rendezvous. He wanted this encounter with the prophets of Baal. He got it and God showed himself. He made himself known. And yet, it brought a situation where he became See, Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of riches. <laughs> and I think both the rich and the poor are deceived by riches. Poor people think that riches are actually going to make them happy. Poor people think that when they get, you know, they hit the jackpot, they become millionaires, multimillionaires, they're finally going to be happy. Rich people know that money doesn't buy happiness. Rich people know that money actually opens up another gate, another door of, of problems, okay? Imagine having so much money that the people around you, you never really know if they like you. You never know if they really love you for who you are. You think they're just around you because of the money that you have. Amen. But rich people have this false sense of security. They're deceived in the sense that they think that because they have money, because they have wealth, that their lives are somehow going to be grounded, and they think that money can, can, can cause them to withstand the, the difficulties and the problems that afflict all people, okay? But it's the rich people who are not deceived by this idea that money is ultimately going to make them happy. If you don't believe it, ask Robin Williams. <laughs> Go dig him up and ask him if money ultimately makes you happy. Go ask Jim Carrey if money ultimately makes you happy. Go dig up Michael Jackson and ask him, does money actually make you happy? <laughs> Are you here? And so he goes before God and he asks for God to kill him. Thank God for unanswered prayer. Amen. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes God sees that what you're asking for is really dumb, really stupid, and he doesn't give it to you. But he goes before God and he says, hey, I'm not better than my father. I'm no better. See, when you're going through hardship, when you're going through difficulty, man, when you're going through drama in life, saints, the default oftentimes is for you to measure yourself and to, to become self-absorbed and to think, man, I must be personally unworthy. Things didn't go the way I wanted to go. I'm not happy. Things didn't really bring the promise that I thought it was going to bring because of my personal unworth. Are you here? And he goes before God and he's complaining. He says, man, they've, they've, they've brought down the altars. They've slain the prophets. I'm the only one left and they want to kill me. And God says that there's 7,000 other people. There's 7,000 men and women of God who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And see, Elijah thought that it was going to be through this encounter, through this showdown on Mount Carmel, that all the people were going to be converted. That's what he thought. He was hoping that revival was going to break out and the people were finally going to realize that God was God, but he didn't get that reception that he wanted. He's on the run now. He was hoping that, I believe he was hoping that Ahab was going to be converted. He was hoping that Jezebel was going to be converted. He was hoping that everybody would finally realize that God is God. 
and they will be pressed toward him. But God says, no. But there are 7,000 people who have not bowed their knee to Baal. See, it wasn't this, this big event. Sometimes we think it's those big events. Sometimes we think it's the sermons that we preach on Sunday morning or the prayer vigils that we hold. Sometimes, saints, it's not about that. Sometimes it's just your daily walk. Sometimes it's, it's the people that are around you that are seeing you in your daily devotion, the way that you do business at work, the, the, the way that you talk to your children. Sometimes it's just those little things that can embolden and empower the people around you to stay with their God. Are you here? Now, saints, think about this. If what Elijah is saying is true, <laughs> that he's the only one left and they want to kill him, if that's really true, shouldn't that give him that much more motivation to live? Think about it. If he's the only prophet of God that's left, shouldn't he be that much more motivated to stay alive? Are you here? But see, when you go before God, <laughs> hallelujah, with your real stuff, with your real feeling, you get what's called correction. Somebody say correction. Don't go before God with your religious stuff. Don't go before God with what you think he wants to hear. Go before God with the truth. And somehow when you go before God with truth, when you go before God with, 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 your, with your honest feelings, he has a way of reorienting your mind. He has a way of correcting how you feel. I remember I was going before God one time, and I was saying, God, I, I honestly feel like you've set me up for evil. God, I honestly feel like you want to make me look bad because I put my trust in you. you. You want my life not to work because of my confession. And as soon as I said it, I realized how stupid it was. Y'all ever been there where you go before God, and as soon as the dumb thing that comes out of your mouth comes out your mouth, you realize how foolish it is. And God has a way of, of redirecting your thoughts. See, saints, the Bible says that if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You can go before God and say, God, I'm not really believing the way I should be believing. How many of us know that unbelief is a sin? Unbelief is a sin. If you go before God and say, God, I'm not really believing the way that I'm supposed to be believing, saints, He's faithful and just not only to forgive you of that, but cleanse you of the unrighteousness. He can cleanse you of the unrighteousness of unbelief. Are you here? There's something about you going before God and say, God, look, I know that you're true. I know that, that you're faithful. I know that it's impossible for you to lie. But God, it, it, it feels like you've tricked me in a way. It feels like you've set me up. And God has a way of turning things around. You can go before God and say, God, I know the Bible says I'm supposed to love everybody, but I don't love everybody. God, I'm, I actually want to kill this person. <laughs> and God would say, you know what, I've killed a few people in my day too. You know, there are some people that I don't like either. You know, in my past, I've had to get rid of some people. they just gone too far. But then you realize how many times you've offended God too. And God tells you, you know what, you've offended me as well, but I haven't killed you. Amen. You get a reorientation of mind. He's able to correct the way that you're thinking. And so Jesus Christ also had to deal with disappointment. Jesus Christ, I want you to look at him. Jesus Christ also had to deal with disappointment. See, if you look at the Old Testament, even in the New there are, there are promises that surround the coming of Messiah that have to do directly with Israel. You can look at Luke, you know, chapter 1, and um, you can see how he was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. He was also supposed to be the glory of Israel. Simeon was waiting on the consolation of Israel. He saw Jesus and he said, hey, I finally, I've, I've seen the consolation of the Lord. I can go home now because I see the one who's supposed to give us relief. Are you here? But how many of us know that Jesus Christ was not received by his own? Jesus Christ was actually rejected by his own people. And I believe that Jesus Christ had to deal with disappointment. If you look at Isaiah chapter 49, 
That scripture is actually talking about Jesus as Messiah. Go back to Isaiah chapter 49. Now, if you look at the King James Version, if you look at verse 3 of Isaiah 49, thank you, Lord. It says, And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Okay? Now, it's capitalized in some versions, but in the King James Version, it's not capitalized. Why? Because they feel like this stuff is kind of beneath Jesus, you know? Um, but how many of us know that Israel means the one who, who governs with God, the ones who, who's ruled by God? Israel was actually given the commission by God to be that light to the world, to be that example that was going to bring the Gentiles into the fold. And so there's a sense in which Jesus Christ was true Israel. Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of that name. And I believe this is actually talking about Jesus. Jesus felt like he had spent his strength for naught. He had labored in vain. This is a messianic chapter, I believe. Okay, now why would Jesus Christ feel as though he had spent his strength for nothing, that he had labored in vain? Like I said, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. You look at Luke chapter 18, where you see that parable uh, of that widow who's pleading God's promise. Are you here? And at the end of the parable, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? On earth. It's almost like Jesus gives a, a sigh. It's almost like Jesus is disappointed. When I come back, am I actually going to find faith? Jesus says, woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in, uh, in Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Are you here? There were people that Jesus Christ did many miracles before. There were people that Jesus Christ did wonders before, and they were not changed. They were not converted. Are you listening to me? When they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, after everything was settled, when, when the dust settled and the smoke cleared, the disciples are like, man, why is it that the scribes say that uh, Elijah must come first? And Jesus says, Elijah did come first. Uh, he already came. And they did to him what they wanted. Uh-oh. People do what they want. <laughs> and Jesus says, watch this, and even as they have done to him, even as they did to Elijah, so they're going to treat the Son of Man. People do in this world what they want to do. <laughs> okay? God doesn't promise you necessarily people because a lot of the problems that you have in your ministry a lot of the problems that you have in your business a lot of the problems that you have in your life were the problems that Jesus Christ had because God doesn't force people to believe are you here if you want to go to a world in which everything that happens is God's will go ahead and get saved and go out in the street and do cartwheels go to heaven that's the world where everything that happens is God's will. But there's a lot of stuff that happens in this life, in this world, saints, that is not God's will. That's why you have to pray God's will to come to pass. Are you here? But how did Jesus Christ deal with his disappointment? How did Jesus Christ deal with the fact that it seemed as though he had spent his strength for naught? He had spent his strength for nothing, that he had labored in vain when it came to his own people. First of all, remember what the Bible says. Hallelujah. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Bible tells us that because of the hope that was set before him, because of the joy that was set before him, he was able to despise the shame. He was able to endure the cross. My, my question to you, saints, is what is your hope? What is that thing? What is that promise that God has given you? <laughs> what is that thing? See, the, the, the land that God had promised, that, that land of, of promise, the promised land, was also a land of rest. Are you here? The promise that God gives you is supposed to invite a certain rest 
into your heart, into your life. That even though things that are around you don't look like God's will, you live with an expectation. You know that what you're going through is bigger than you. Are you here? You know that what's passing through your life is bigger than you, and it's leading to a conclusion. Hallelujah. I know that the marriage is rocky right now, but it's leading to a conclusion. Even though it's not God's will that this thing, that this trouble is happening, but know that God is able to make it work for your good. Now you come out of that, hallelujah, you come out of that troubled marriage. You come out of that troubled relationship with an anointing now to help other people who are going through the same thing that you went through. Because know that this too shall pass. Jesus Christ had hope. Jesus Christ had expectation that kept him grounded when he had to go through what he had to go through. Are you listening to me? And the scripture says, man, look at the aisles. Somebody say the aisles. God has promised Jesus the aisles. What does that mean? The aisles refer to the Gentiles. Okay? It's saying that Jesus, look. Even though your own people are not necessarily going to believe in you to the full, I'm giving you another people. Hallelujah. And the people that I'm giving you are actually grander and greater in number than the people that you want. The people that you want. And say, saints, the Gentile world, in a sense, they needed Jesus more than the Jews. The Jews already had the revelation of God. The, the Jews already had the Old Testament. The Jews already had covenant promises. And, and if you look at the Jews throughout history, they, they've had prosperity. They, they've had life, man. Jews have prospered basically wherever they've gone with persecution. Are you here? My question that I'm asking you, saints, is it possible that you're serving the people that you love? Watch this, saints. But God is actually pushing you to serve the people that need you the most. I know that you love your job. I know that you love your boss. I know that you love what you're doing. But is it possible that your children need you more than the boss does? Are you here? I know that you're a good stenographer. You're a good lawyer. You're a good businessman or a good businesswoman. But you're not a good mother. Are you here? You're not a good father. Is it possible that God is guiding you? He's directing you toward the people that really need you the most. And is it possible that your views are too narrow? Is it possible that your views are too small? Is it possible that God is actually aiming at something that's bigger than what you're aiming for? See, the destiny that you have in Jesus Christ is actually Christ-likeness. Are you here? He is calling you to be like Jesus. And, and a lot of the promises that God gives to you, they are most, man, how can I put it? You, you, you sense it most internally. Okay, the truth of God, the, 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 the promise of God is oftentimes felt more internally than it is externally. Are you here? And God is actually after your growth. He actually wants you to be somebody. The devil doesn't care who you are. That's why you can do business with him. He'll give you what you want, and he'll give it to you whenever you want it. Why? Because he's not interested in your character. He's not interested in how you turn out. But God will oftentimes make you wait on a thing. Why? Because he's more interested in your internal reality. He's more interested in your holiness. He's more interested in the reality of your heart. But make no mistake about it, saints of God. If you really know God, and he's really spoken to you, and he's made a promise to you, it will come to pass. Jesus says that no man lights a candle to put it underneath the bushel. Hallelujah. That means that if you have the light of God, if you have the wisdom of God, ultimately it will result in a testimony. Ultimately it's going to produce a reality in your life that's going to be bigger than the four corners of your house. Are you here? Eventually, if you continue in that word, Hallelujah. If you continue fighting the good fight of faith and don't let the obstacles nor the word of Satan stop you from continuing what God has given you to do, know that there is a dark corner of reality that is waiting for your illumination. 
Hallelujah. The promises of God will never drive you into obsolescence. I'm, what I'm saying is that if, if he's given you a gift, if he's given you a talent, if he's given you an ability, there will never be a time where the ability or the talent or the gift that you have becomes useless. Are you here? You simply have to find your place. If where you are right now, if the people are not receiving you, that means that you have to keep your eyes open to the world that God is bringing you towards. But make no mistake about it. If you have a gift, if you have an, a talent, you have an anointing that comes from God, there, are, there is a people that's waiting for you. Glory be to God. He sets the desolate in families. Are you listening to me? Mm. And though that the promises of God, they start off small. If you look at Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives the parable of the sower. And know that his mode of teaching has changed. They're asking him, Jesus, why are you teaching in parable now? And he starts talking about what Isaiah saw, where the people became hard of heart. And they had eyes, but they didn't see. Are you here? They had ears, but they wouldn't hear. Are you listening to me? And he, he starts giving you these images, these, these parables of the kingdom. And he talks about how the kingdom of God is, is, is like yeast hidden in three measures of meal. And he talks about how the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And, and it's planted. And it starts off small, but it grows large. Are you here? He starts, he's, he's talking this way because he realizes, if you look at Matthew chapter 12, the people reject him. Okay, they start talking about how Jesus is doing his work. He's casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. They've rejected him. And he starts talking about how the kingdom of God has small beginnings. Are you here? He gives you parables that show you that in God's kingdom, things start off small. And your job is not to despise the day. Are you here? You don't despise the small beginnings. You don't despise the small starts. Why is it that the things of God usually start off small? Because if you're doing something that God has given you to do, listen to me, saints. If you're doing something that God has given you to do, it requires heavy labor. It requires a serious commitment. Why? Because with the world, <laughs> if you're trying to do some worldly endeavor, you're trying to agree with what is. Are you here? False prophets, false preachers, false teachers agree with what is. They agree with what you already believe. They agree with the orientation of your heart. They don't say things to challenge you. They don't say things to get you to walk in the right direction. They're not willing to labor, are you here, to change the way that you think so that your mind can actually agree with God's will. No, they just agree with where you already are so they, can so they can flourish immediately. But if you're doing God's work, you are doing the impossible. Are you here? An impossible, man, glory be to God. You are doing the impossible if you're doing God's will, and it requires for things to change. It requires for people to change. It requires for circumstances to change. It requires for you not to agree with the world that's around you, but to agree with God. And eventually what's within you man, will become your outer reality. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, guard your heart above all things. For out of your heart, out of your inner man will flow the issues of life. Hallelujah. A lot of the people that we celebrate right now, we celebrate Dr. King now. <laughs> you think there was a Dr. King day when he was walking on this earth? No. A lot of the people that we celebrate now were not celebrated in their own time. And some of us have the idea, well, I, I'm not going to live for the future. I'm not going to live for the future generations. They ain't done nothing for me. I'm not going to do nothing for my grandchildren or my great-great-grandchildren. They ain't done nothing for me. But what they can do for you, saints, is give you a noble purpose. Are you listening to me? The generations that come after you, and, you, and you're not going to necessarily see all that God does in them or, 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 or through them. 
But saints, it can give you a sense of nobility, knowing that not everything that God promised you is necessarily going to be realized in your own life. But do you have, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Do you have the faith of Jacob? <laughs> Bible says in Hebrews that he worshiped leaning upon a staff. Knowing that not everything that God promised him was going to be realized in his own life. But he was able to bring the blessing to the seed that was going to come after him. Are you listening to me? Are you willing to live not only for yourself, but live for the future? Jesus Christ, like many of the people that came before their time. There are some people that are before their time, saints. They're revolutionary thinkers. They're, they are statesmen. They're, they are inventors. They're, they are idealists. They are visionaries that come before their time. And very rarely are those people fully received in the time that they live in. Are you here? Jesus Christ was not fully received in the time that he lived in. But he's been given a name that's higher and greater than every other name. There's nobody on earth right now that's more famous than Jesus. Not everybody believes in him, but Christianity is the largest religion, religion in the world. And nobody has more acclaim than he does. Are you here? Glory be to God. As I conclude, conclude, saints, as I come to a close, I want you to realize, I want you to recognize that what you're going through, like I said before, is always bigger than what you individually, personally are going through. It's always bigger than how it looks. It's always bigger than what it seems. And your fight is to keep your heart right with God. In the midst of all the trial, in the midst of all the difficulty, can you keep your heart centered in the goodness of God? Can you keep your priorities intact? See, Moses, excuse me, Moses, he started off as somebody who thought that he could do it all. <laughs> he had false confidence. And then he got to the point where he had a false sense of incompetence, you know. You know, he goes in the wilderness and God calls him to do all this stuff. And he's like, who am I? At first, man, he was so confident about who he was. And he felt like everybody should understand who he was, that he was God's golden boy. He gets from a false confidence to a false humility. Are you here? He gets to the point where, who am I? I can't do this thing. And then, man, he gets to a real confidence. Not a confidence in himself, but a confidence in his God. Are you here? He gets to the point where he recognizes that it's not by might. It's not by power. It's not by whether or not his lips are circumcised. It's about whether or not the God that he believes in is with him. Are you here? And at some point, he has a, a conversation with Jehovah God. And, and God is like, hey, Moses, I'm sick of these people. They're stiff-necked. I'm just going to go ahead and kill them all. And I'm going to have you start off with your own people. I'm, I'm going to give you a starter kit, as it were, for your own people. You're going to be like Abraham and just have your own people. You're going to be greater than Abraham. Not only are you going to have your own people, but you're going to be the one that leads them into the promised land. You're going to have double glory. And Moses, hey, by keeping with God, he has this heart, man. God, if you're not going to go with us, if you're not going to get my people where you want them, you can just go ahead and blot my name out. And, and Moses is not better than God. Are you here? It wasn't God's desire to really kill the people and start afresh. He was testing the heart of his servant. Okay, that desire, that love that he had for God's people, where was it from? Where did it come from? It was birthed from God. And God will get you to that point, saints, where you are so unselfish that you would rather that the, the, the promise of God go unfulfilled. That, that you get there without the people that God has assigned you to be with. Are you here? He will get you to the point through, co through communion with him. He'll get you to the point where you are so unselfish and so in lock with his purposes. That you won't even want the promise if the people that God wants to have the promise and share it with you, if they can't enter into it. Are you listening to me? Saints of God, I remember when I was, I was 16 years old. And... Uh, I was lifting weights. 
I was trying to bench press 405 pounds. And I don't know if y'all have seen what that looks like. It's like a bar, and you got 445 plates on each side. And the first time that I tried to do it, I couldn't do it. The, the, the bar was on my chest, and I couldn't, I couldn't get it up. And I was a little bit despondent. I was a little bit dispirited. But then I came to the revelation that the whole purpose of lifting weights is what? To get stronger. And even though I wasn't able to lift the weight off my chest the first time around, I got stronger. The point was to get stronger. And the second time around, I was able to get that thing off my chest. Even in my failure, I was strengthened and I was brought further into my purpose. Are you here? Saints, I thank you for listening as long as you did. Praise the name of the Lord. If you wish to give, we have our cash app, 508-389-3589. Once again, 508-389-3589. Pastor Adewale, if you'd be so kind. Thank you so much, Pastor Emmanuel Adieu. Amen. Can you give Jesus clap, another clap offering? Give that offering. It's for me. I will look at that. I don't watch worth much to you. Amen. Raise so that Jesus will stand up and clap mightily. So say thank you, Jesus, for the message. Amen. May God continue to increase you, sir. From strength to strength. Uh, that is what we really require to move forward. And I pray, one thing I receive, that you shall move from where you are to where God wants to be. That you shall press forward in the name of Jesus. By the strength of him that enabled us, it's no more by our power, nor by our strength, or by he that is heaven, that we put our absolute trust in him. And we always say that he's able to do, to fulfill all what he has promised us. We must never look and put our strength, our hope in ourselves. But once we put it in him, it's very dicey, right? When Pastor Emmanuel was preaching, I, I look at Peter, he trusts Jesus. He knows that he trusted. And out of all the disciples, he asked, Jesus, can I come over the water? Can I do like you? And Jesus said, yes, come. And the beginning of the journey was very nice. But what went wrong immediately after that? That is why we should look at ourselves sometimes. That we need more than what we start with. Amen. <laughs> some people could have said that if it was, if there are some days in between, I'm telling you some theologians who say, yeah, maybe he committed some sin before at that time. Maybe there was something quarreling. Maybe they, they, they will give divination. But right the same day, the same moment, the faith was working for him. And some things happened which I believe must be in his mind. Which I believe must be inside him. Which I believe must be the failure that he overcome before came up to him again. And that is why we can know that defeat comes from us, not from outside. But from this moment, from this morning, you are undefeatable. You shall not be defeated. The power of God, the word of God shall strengthen us to the end. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your power. We thank you for strengthening us. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for those things you have overcome before. And the strength we have received to overcome now and forever. May your name be glorified in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that this week, Father, bless us. Every day of this week, Lord, load us with blessings. 
and help us strengthen us to overcome challenges. But the end of this week, Lord, there shall be testimony. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace of God, the grace in fellowship to our King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the presence of that Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.